Good Monday. Um, I'm moving along on my robe. I'm very happy about the progress. Um, I've finished this central area, which uh, really has three uh, horizontal patterns, the raven's hood, the lattice, and then uh, followed with the raven's hood. And now we're getting into this solid blue um, little border that uh, that goes above and below the uh, row of tina, the copper shields. So uh, I have just one more row on this and then we'll jump right into placing those copper shields and, and moving down on them. So um, welcome. I'll be demonstrating. Um, I will talk a little bit about this technique that I'm doing and then I will um, also uh, then go into telling a story. I like to read stories from the old, old stories that were collected in the early 1900s. And I think that they reveal many cultural elements, uh, sometimes about our garments and uh, the power and prestige of our garments. Other times, just our relationship with our environment and all of the um, other living beings that um, share our, our island, our world, and um, natural and supernatural. So I like to share those stories too. So welcome. Thank you. So here I am. I brought, I entered over here and, and then I brought the two pairs um, of the black and the blue over. So I've got to find the right pairs and then I have the blue here and it's going to go and enclose the last two here. Now I'm going to take this, this band is blue, so what I'm going to do is push these two blacks to the back and keep the two blues up in front. And I, so I move these two blacks behind two warps and up. So then I take the um I'm handling these two um, warps. These two black warps are going to go behind these, this, um, the blue. So they'll always be behind the blue. So I'm taking them behind two and up. And then I'm taking one of the um, blue weavers. And I'm going to bring the black around that blue weaver and then push it to the back and then behind two and then forward. Now this one is going to always be my top. I'm going to handle this and consider it my top um, weft. And oftentimes when I'm weaving, I'll just throw it, throw it over the bar loom. But right now I'm so deep into my uh, my robe that I can't throw it over the bar loom. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to. Um, put slip stitches on the one that is designated as the top one. And then I'm going to bring it over. And now I'm going to take this other blue weaver and bring it to the black. And then that black is going to go over and behind two and forward. So now this is my bottom one. So I'm just going to let that one drop. And then I'm going to pick up the one that is what I consider the top one. And again, the black will go around over it and to the back. So the black one will always be to the back. And that's why it's called a rigid weft. It's rigidly carried all the way across in the back. So what you see here is a nice solid blue, but the back is all black. So let me show you that. 
you'll see that that is, and you'll see a row of dots. So those are um, where the black wefts are. And these come up as solid. So I'll be weaving and then I'll, I'll, I'll um, narrate a story. I'm going to read a story that is in the Clinket Myths and Texts, recorded by John R. Swanton, I believe in 1909. It's uh, story 33 in this book, and it's the origin of the Kunaka date. And I just want to say that I apologize about my mispronunciation. I'm not a Clinket speaker, but I think it's Kunaka date. In a village somewhere to the northward, a high caste person had married a high caste girl from a neighboring village. His mother-in-law lived with them, and she disliked her son-in-law very much because he was a lazy fellow, she thought, fond only of gambling. As soon as they were through with their meals, she would say to the slaves, let that fire go out at once. She did not want her son-in-law to have anything to eat there. Long after dark, the man would come in, and they would hear him eating. Then his mother-in-law would say, I suppose my son-in-law has been felling a tree for me. Next morning, he would go out again, very early. His wife thought it was useless to say anything. The same thing happened every evening. When summer came, all the people went for salmon, and the gambler accompanied them. After he had hung up quite a lot of this salmon and dried it, he took it up into the woods beside a lake and made a house there out of dry wood. Then he began chopping with his stone axe upon a big tree which stood a little distance back. It took him a very long time to bring it down. After he had felled it into the lake, he made wedges out of very hard wood and tied their thick ends with roots to make them strong. He tried to split the tree along its whole length. And when he had accomplished this, he put cross pieces between to hold the two sections apart. Then he baited his line with salmon, with the bright part turned out, and let it down in between. He had been told that there was a monster in that lake, and he was going to find out. By and by, he felt his line move, and when he pulled up quickly, it broke. The next time, however, he pulled it up still more rapidly, and the creature followed it to the surface between the two halves of the tree. And then he pushed the cross pieces out so that the halves of the tree sprang together and caught its head while he jumped ashore. He stood on a grassy spot nearby to watch, and then the monster struggled hard to get away. It was so strong that it kept dragging the tree clear under water, but at last it died. Now the man spread the cedar apart by means of his cross pieces, dragged out the monster's body, and examined it. He saw that it had very sharp, strong teeth and that its claws looked like copper. Then he skinned it with the claws, dried it very carefully, got inside, and went into the water. It began to swim away with him, and it swam down to the monster's house under the lake, which was very beautiful. After this man had come up again, he left his skin in a hole in a dry tree nearby and went home, but did not say a word to anybody about what he had discovered. When winter came, all went back to their village, and the following spring there was a famine. One morning the man said to his wife, I'm going away. I'll be here every morning just before the ravens are awake. If you hear a raven before I get back, don't look for me any more. Then he again got into the monster's skin and swam to his house. He found that from there he could go out into the sea. So he swam along in the sea, found a king salmon and brought it back. He took off his skin and left it where he had put it. The salmon he cared to carried to town and left on the beach close to the houses. Next morning, this man's mother-in-law got up early, went out, and came upon a salmon. She thought that it had drifted there, so she took it home. And then she came in and said to her husband, I have found a fine big salmon. They cooked it for all the people in the village and distributed the food, as was formerly the custom. Next evening, her son-in-law did the very same thing, only he caught two salmon. And then he went to bed. 
He told his wife that it was he who was getting these salmon, but he, she must not say a word about it. The third time he brought salmon in, and his mother-in-law found them. She considered the matter very deeply. Her son-in-law would sleep all day, but not really up at, to eat until it was almost evening. Before this, he had been in the in the habit of rising very early in order to gamble. When he got up next day, the old woman said to him, the idea of starving people who are sleeping all day. If I did not go around picking up dead salmon, the whole village would be starving. He listened to what she said, and afterward he and his wife laughed about it. Next evening, he went out again and caught a very large halibut. Meanwhile, his mother-in-law treated him worse and worse. She said, I will never go out again in the morning to find anything. I know that the people in this village would starve if I did not find things. After that, she found the seal, and then she singed the hair off, scraped it in water to make the skin white. Her son-in-law lay in bed, taking everything in. Also, when a canoe landed in front of the town, his mother-in-law would say, I suppose my son-in-law has brought in a load of seal, and he listened to her as he lay there. In the middle of that night, the old woman pretended that she had spirits. The spirit in her said, I am a spirit that finds all this food for you. And then she said to her husband as she lay in bed, have a mask made for me and let them name it food finding spirit. Have a claw hat made. So her husband sent for the best carver in town and he made all of the things she had asked for. Her husband had an apron made for her with puffin beaks all around it. After that, spirits came to her and mentioned that she was going to what she was going to find. She rattled her rattle, and her spirits would say that she was rattling it over the whole village. Her son-in-law lay abed listening. The whole village believed in her and thought that she was a wonderful shaman. The first time the woman went out, she found one salmon. The next time, two salmon. The third time, halibut. The fourth time, two halibut, and after that, a seal. Now she said her spirits told her that she was going to find two seals. So her son-in-law, who had heard it, went out the following night and found the two seals. His wife felt very badly for him because her mother nagging him constantly. She talked more and more of her spirits all the time. And the high caste people invited to their feasts spoke very highly of them. <clears throat> she would sing how high her spirits were and the village paid her a great deal of attention, but she called her son-in-law sleeping man. She gave him to eat only a few scraps left over and would say to the people, leave some scraps there for sleeping man. This went on for a long time, but he thought he would not get another whale. Oh, this went on for a long time and he did find a whale and brought it to the village. <clears throat> Meanwhile, his mother-in-law continued to say spiteful things about him, things to make the village people laugh at him. And now that she had spirits, she was worse than ever. Quite a long time after this, however, he did catch two whales and tried to swim ashore with them. He worked all night over them. And when he got near the place where he used to leave things on the beach, the raven called and he died. When his wife heard the raven cry, she remembered what he had said and began dressing herself, crying as she did so. Still, she remained indoors, knowing that the whole village would go down to see the monster. Then her mother walked out and used and usual as usual and saw two whales there with a monster between them. It had two fins on its back, long ears, and a very long tail. All of the people went there to look. <clears throat> there is a terrible monster there. Come down to look. It is something very strange. They did not know what it was, but supposed that it was the old woman's spirit. At last, when she heard all this racket coming in, the chief's daughter started down to the steps from the high foundation as they used to build on those days. And she wept very loudly as she descended so that all the people could hear her. They looked at her and wondered what was wrong with her thinking. What does that high caste woman mean by calling the monster her husband? 
Nobody would go near, for they were afraid of the chief, of the chief's daughter, and of the monster. But when the girl had come down and said to his, her mother, who was still looking at the monster, Where are your spirits now? You are a storyteller. You say that you have spirits when you have not. That is why this happened to my husband. Now the interest was so intense that people had crawled up on the roofs of the houses and on other high places to look at the monster. Mother, is this your food-finding spirit? How is it that your spirit should die? Spirits all over the world never die. If this is your spirit, make it come to life again. Then the girl went close to the monster and said to the village people, Some of you that are very clean, come and help me. Her husband had died in the act of holding the jaws of the monster apart and to come out, one hand on each. When the people saw this, they were very much surprised and said, He must have been captured by that monster. From that time on, this monster has been known as the Kunagotveit. The people helped to take the woman's husband and the monster's skin up to the edge of the lake and put them into the hollow of the tree. And there they saw the log, broken hammers and wedges lying about where he had killed it and reported to the rest of the people so that everyone went there to look. But the old woman was so ashamed that she remained indoors and died. When they found her body, blood was coming from her mouth. Every evening after that, the, after this, the dead man's wife went to the foot of the tree which contained his body and wept. One evening, however, she, received, she saw a ripple in the lake, and then the creature said to her, Come here. It was the voice of her husband. Get on my back, it said, and hold tight. She did so, and he swam down to the monster's former house. This monster is the Gunagodet that brings good luck to those that see him. His wife also brings good luck to those who see her, and so do their children, the daughters of the creek who live at the head of every stream.